Welcome to the 100th episode of Season 7 of the Apollo Papyrus Podcast. I am Aaron Apollo Camp. For this episode, my interview guest is the author of the novel Bodies That Die For, which, while a work of fiction, is based on real-life issues like body image and diet culture. Her name is Lori Brand, and here's my interview with Lori. Lori Brand, welcome to Apollo Papyrus. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Feel free to introduce yourself to our listeners. So, um, my name is Lori Brand, and I have my debut thriller, Bodies to Die For, launching from Blackstone this June. I'm extremely excited about it. Um, In past lives, I've been a gymnast, I've been a dancer, I've been a stripper, I've been a playboy model, um, I've been a bodybuilder. And currently, I work as a software quality engineer. And I also teach yoga class. I've been a fitness instructor, a spinning instructor, and I love lifting weights. And I'm a huge proponent of getting weights, of lifting weights. When you were in the fourth grade, uh, yes. you, uh, your dance instructor at that time uh, ha- had her jaw wired shut as a purely elective procedure yes. uh, to lose weight. Looking yeah. back on that now, how jarring uh, was that? It was extremely, it was extremely shocking. And the, I, it left, it left a huge imprint on me. It just had a huge, enormous impact on me. And it wasn't, I mean, I was obviously bad enough that she had her child wear shut right now. I, I had to go there you know, every week and her assistant taught the class. And so Barb would sit off in the corner. Um, she would, with a notebook and she would take notes. But you know, over weeks and weeks and weeks, I watched her get smaller and smaller and smaller. And I was so freaked out that like, that that she wired at Joshua intentionally and that none of the other adults seemed to like think that this was freaky. Like the world just moved on. Everybody shrugged because like, you know, because she was overweight, I guess, and she was a dance teacher and it was important. And it left such an impact on me. You know, how, how important was it to be, to be thin? It, it was that important. And it, it, uh, it really kind of introduced me to the world of diet culture. And I've kind of had my eye on it ev- ever since, <laughs> you know. Without spoiling too much about your book, uh-huh. Bodies to Die For, what is it about? And is it fiction or nonfiction? It's fiction. It's a thriller. It's a novel. Um, so it is about the, it's got two main point of view, two characters, um, two main characters. One is Gemma, who used to be um, over 100, 100 pounds overweight, but lost a bunch of weight and became a fitness influencer. She became an IFBB bikini pro. That, that's a bodybuilding type of pro. And, um, you know, it's basically making her living off of off of her great body. And she's got a good looking husband and she's living her life on Instagram. But behind the scenes, her, her world is falling apart. And she's got this fat Gemma who lurks inside of her, who she's just terrified is going to come back and destroy her life. And then the other main point of view character is Ashley, who is a software engineer who is who is overweight. And she's been overweight pretty much her whole life. And we see how the world treats her because of it. And she's very frustrated. And she falls in with a group of fat activists and pretty much the book becomes about the fit girls and the fat activists clashing a series of murders that takes place. And, but the underlying theme of this book is the war on women's bodies, the wars that we wage on each other and the wars that we wage on ourselves. And that's a huge theme of my book. And at the very, very end, what we really come to realize is that when I wrote this book, it was originally called Body Wars. Uh, the publisher renamed it to Bodies to Die For because it sounds more like a thriller. But I, I still consider it to be Body Wars. And the realization is that you win the body war by walking away. You'll never make everybody happy. You, you can never please you know, the, 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 their external beauty standards anyway. And that instead of looking externally and trying to shrink to please society, Instead, if you can change your focus to getting strong, it's a complete game changer. Instead of wanting to shrink and to to be small, you're looking to nourish your body. You're looking to get strong. You're looking to grow. It's a completely different mindset. Um, You become stronger mentally because of it. And then the other 
thing at the end too, is that they realize that we are, as women, we need to stop ripping each other apart and stop tearing each other down. And we need to work together to make for a better tomorrow. So that's why did you there. decide to write bodies to die for? And why did you decide to write it uh, as a work of fiction instead of nonfiction? Well, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm not a, I don't have, I, my, my life is maybe not quite as, you know, I'm, I'm nobody special, right? I'm, I'm not anybody. Important. So in general, if you're going to write a memoir, um, it works much better if like you're a famous actress or a musician or something like that, that, that somebody would be interested in. I, I don't have a particularly, you know, interesting life. Um, I mean, it's a little bit interesting, interesting to me, but if I want other people to read it, um, I have to make it pretty interesting. And so my, my world was quite as interesting. Also with fiction, you can control it completely. You can control that art, you can control that tension, you can control where different beats happen and you can control the resolution and the outcome. And that um, I really wanted to throw a magnifying glass up to the world, um, the world that we were living in. And I wanted to really examine all facets of that, of, of, um, of diet culture. And the impact it has on so many varieties of people's lives. And the best way for me to do that was, was in fiction where I could completely manipulate the world. What was the hardest part about writing your book? I think it was finding the time. Um, I have a full-time job. I work as a as an engineer Monday through Friday. Um, I, I teach uh, yoga classes on the weekends. I do volunteer work on the weekends. It was very hard for me to... to fit this in um and to do it and to do it again and again and again day after day after day week after week year after year to just keep getting up and to keep trying knowing that the overwhelming majority of, of books will never find an agent they'll never get sold and um to keep to keep at it to keep throwing myself out there was um it, it just took a lot of belief in this message what do you want people to take away from reading your book I would like people to, uh, two, two things, to what I would really like it if people chose to want to get strong, um, to, to quit scrutinizing their body in a negative way to, to fighting their body instead of looking at it as uh, something that you want to take care of and that you, you want to nourish it. You, know, you don't want to starve it. You want to nourish it and help it get strong. I'd love people to to want to start lifting weights. Um Ashley actually got into it. That's the other character got into uh, boxing, but whatever strong is for you. But I'd like people to want to get strong and I'd like people to be kind to each other and to realize that whatever people look like on the outside, we don't know their personal journeys. We don't know their personal struggles and to just give each other some compassion and some grace. And so often, you know, we say, well, society is this way. Society is that way. But you know what? Society is all of us. And we, we need to work in our immediate spheres to control, to, to influence our immediate spheres and to, to be kind to each other and, and to spread, to spread the light that way. You mentioned a little bit about this and regarding uh, the title of your book. What was your journey to publishing Bodies to Die for like? Oh, so, okay. So I think it's important. Yeah. It sounds like people who read or listen to your podcast are uh, writers. So this is important to know that this is not the first book that I um, I wrote. I wrote a whole other book, created a whole different manuscript, didn't get an agent, didn't sell it. In hindsight, I'm, I'm glad I did. That one wasn't as polished. Um, I wrote that book pretty much for me. It was something that I needed to kind of work through. This book I wrote, I wrote for, I've actually dedicated this book to all women everywhere. This book I wrote for the world. I really wanted women to read this book. And, and it was that determination that I wanted my message out there that gave me that drive. So for this book, I, um, you know, I, I wrote it, I wrote it, I wrote it. It took me maybe, maybe four or five, six months to write it. And then I, I sent it off to beta readers. I got some of their feedback. I incorporated their feedback. I rewrote the book. Then I, um, I sent it out. I queried it with different agents. Uh, I, I was able to get an agent. I was very thankful for that. It took me probably 60, 60 or so queries to get an agent. And then my agent and I rewrote the book a million times. And then he took it out on submission. And also, if your listeners, I don't know if they're aware, um, 
it's very possible for a book to die on submission. Like, like nobody, nobody might buy the book or they might, there might be an editor who's interested in it, but it will, it will die in submission. The uh, marketing and publicity people won't think that they can sell it. In my case, we were very fortunate. The editor who was interested in it took it to his publicity and his marketing team and uh, they loved it. And my, my book was bought. My book was bought in May of 2022. And it's going to be launched in June of 2024. So traditional publishing is a really long road. I'll just say that. <laughs> what is diet culture and how destructive can it be for people who partake in it? So it, so diet culture is that constant drip of, um, of, of society letting you know what the ideal body type is. We see it in, you know, if you're ever lying, say at a grocery store, all those magazines that you see, you know, lot, you know, lose five pounds in a week, lose, you know, two drop two dress sizes in a month, you know, get a thigh gap, things like that. We see it in um in, in the my book, uh, we see Ashley's mother who is always kind of nitpicking at her to, to lose weight. And it comes from a place of, of concern because her mom's concerned about her health, but that you know, her, her mom always kind of scrutinizing her body. We see it in, um, in online. People online are, can say cruel comments, uh, that they do to Ashley in, in my book. Uh, we, we see diet culture in, um, in our friend groups and, uh, in, in the bodies to die for. There are some of the women don't want to be, have their picture taken with people who are overweight because they're, they're fitness influencers and they're, they're afraid it will lower their brand. Uh, we, we see diet culture in, um, oh, we see it in our friends, right? We see it in, like, uh, you know, you might have a friend who says, oh, I, I don't want to go to that party. I've gotten so fat. And, you know, we see it when, when mothers talk to each other and they don't really realize that their daughters are listening. You know, when you have two moms having coffee together and saying, you know, oh, you know, I, I want to lose some weight. I, I feel like I've gotten so, so fat. You know, and that there's, you know, little girls are sitting around and they're listening to that. It's just this constant message that, it's just everywhere and it affects not just people who are overweight, but it affects, it affects people of all sizes. Like, like I said, um, you know, when, when I was 10 years old and my dance teacher had her jaw wired shut, I was very slim. Um, but even in my twenties, um, when I was working as a, as a stripper, um, you know, I had a, a what, what would be considered to be um, culturally a, a very nice body, but I was terrified of getting fat. So it affects, it affects you, whether you're, Thin, whether you're overweight, it affects you if you're young or you're, it affects kids as young as like preschool. They've noticed it. Um, and they've done studies. One of my friends was telling me that she was recently visiting her mom in like a nursing home. And some of the little old ladies there, like they're like, they're in a nursing home, right? And they're, they're concerned about like not getting fat, you know, like, I mean, that's just, that's just really something, right? That, that it's a def, for it to affect you for decades like that. So that, that's what I would consider to be diet culture. How does diet culture impact women today? And you've, already, and you've already talked about this quite a bit, but especially, and also this does affect men to some, uh, to a much lesser extent, but especially with visually, visual media oriented social media platforms like Instagram being mm -hmm. prevalent, how does diet culture impact uh, people today? Oh, well, very much because, um, you know, what is being put on social media is it's a cultivated picture. Um, sometimes people are even, you know, photoshopping pictures and, uh, you know, stylizing them so that it presents an unrealistic standard. And, and I'm not, I'm not actually against social media. I actually like Instagram. Um, I'm probably one of the few people that like Instagram, but you know, if you can, because I think it's, it's great to be able to come together and meet other people. But if you view these other women as your competition or as something that you are not, if it makes you feel less than, um, in, in that case, it would probably not be healthy for you. I also think it doesn't just affect women. One, one of the biggest surprises of me since my book has gotten out there is I've actually had some some men tell me their diet culture horror stories. I, I had a guy... Um, who there was a producer who was potentially interested in um, buying the movie rights. They, they never made an offer. So I, I don't know what became of that, but I, I met with my agent, I met with the producer, but he had, um, he told me that I guess when he was a kid, his parents used to send him to fat camp. And so he really, really resonated with um, 
how how Gemma had that fat Gemma in her mind, how she was so scared of fat Gemma. Because when I was talking to him, it was on a Zoom call. He was a trim guy. I guess he slimmed down when he was like in high school or college or something. He he uh, does CrossFit now. But he said that in the back of his mind, he's always afraid that like it's just going to spiral out of control and he's going to end up fat again. And so my, my book resonated with him. Um, I also think it uh, it resonates with, or I also think it affects men in the sense of what they look for potentially in a girlfriend or in a wife. And I, I do understand, you know, that, their, that health is correlated with, um, you know, with body size, some, somewhat, right? So, some, somewhat. So I, I can see, I can see somehow or somewhat how that is um, an innate preference. But I think it's more than that. You know, it's uh, not wanting to maybe be, but wanting to be seen with a, what would be considered a good looking girlfriend, um, you know, by, by society standards. But I, I, I know it's affected men more recently than it has say 20 years ago. The exact opposite of diet culture is the healthy at every size movement. Is yep. that the answer to the destructive aspects of diet culture and why or why not? Okay. So, and so this is, this is the thing that my book um, really explores, right? Is the, so both, I look at both the good sides and the underbelly of, of both of these things. So fitness, inher- you know, inherently fitness is good, right? You, you, you want to be able to, you know, move comfortably. You want your body to be able to, you know, run a mile if it has to. You want to, you want to nourish your body with healthy food. These, these are good things. But, you know, I was involved in bodybuilding and um, bodybuilding can have a, an ugly side to it and and diet culture can have that ugly side to it. But what we've noticed or what I've noticed in the last few years, initially I was a really big fan of the health at every size movement, which I think has so many good, so many good components about it. You know, you don't want to be waiting until you're like a size six to go to the beach or to start your life or anything like that. And you, you don't want to hate your body. You want to nourish your body. You want to work with your body and so there's so much good about it. But one of the things that started me writing this book was um, in, I'll, it all started in 2020. So in January 2020, Liz or uh, Julia Michaels was interviewed on BuzzFeed News. And uh, somebody asked her, the interviewer asked her what she thought of Lizzo as a role model, how so many people were embracing her as a body positivity role model. And Julia said, what, why, why are we talking about her body and not her music? Because it's not going to be great if she gets diabetes. And, and social media blew up, right? And um, and Julia did apologize probably within 24 hours, but people were really, really, really hating on her. And um, I think she got some death threats. And about three or four months later, Adele had posted a picture of herself to Instagram for her birthday, just a picture of herself for her birthday. And she had it was clear in the picture that she had lost a lot of weight and and again instagram blew up and people were saying um you know there there was a good segment of people who were disappointed that they were disappointed in her because they felt like she had succumbed to diet culture the thing is she doesn't owe anybody her body and she can do whatever she wants with it um nobody should have to answer for their body and it was it was sort of right around that time where I started to see sort of the ugly underbelly of, of just a small segment of the healthy at any size movement. And so I started to think, well, what if, you know, more like the, the fat activist portion of it that was um, viewing with disdain um, the fitness, uh, women who were involved in fitness. And it was that that made me think, what if these two cultures clashed? And that's that's where Bodies to Die For came from. What is your own fitness routine like? So my, mine is a lot, but um, so I would I probably wouldn't advise it to the average person um, because I, I actually really really enjoy exercise. I'm just somebody who enjoys exercise. So I exercise almost almost every day of the week. I usually do about thirty minutes, twenty to thirty minutes of cardio. It's just a low low intensity, steady straight, like a like a Peloton bike class or an elliptical. But then I lift a lot of weights. So I lift lower body on Wednesdays and Sundays. I lift upper body on Tuesdays and Saturdays. On Mondays and Thursdays, I usually go to an obstacle training course because it's just really, really fun to scale walls and um, ropes and swing from ropes and rings and all sorts of stuff. Um, And then on Friday, I either take Friday off or I do like a long Peloton class, like a a 45-minute bike ride. 
Then on, on Saturdays, I teach, uh, I teach three yoga classes. Um, two of them are only half an hour though. And then I usually play an hour and a half of tennis, but the tennis is ladies doubles and it's, it's like, it's practically bridge. You know, we, we talk a lot. So it, it, it sounds like a lot. But the, the, oh, and I also on Sundays, I, I box for, I also have boxing, um, for 45 minutes. That's a more recent, um, thing that I've taken up because I just really enjoy it. But you, nobody would have to do this much. Um, if, if I wanted to scale back, if I, if I didn't enjoy it as much as I do, you could very comfortably scale that back to like doing cardio, um, maybe three or four days a week and, um, maybe lifting, maybe, three days a week, full body works right, right now. I, I, I split my body parts, but you could, you could, you could lift Monday, Wednesday, Friday, um, a smaller, you could do, you could do, you could do bench pull-ups, squats, and like deadlifts or something and, and, and call it good. Um, that's a lot though. Those are a lot of compound exercises, but, but you, you wouldn't have to do as much as I'm doing. I just really enjoy it. What advice do you have for people who want to get in shape as well as for parents who want their children to have a positive body image? Okay. So for people who want to get in shape, I would suggest, so I guess I, I, I don't know, you know, there's going to be all different levels out there, but start with something that's really manageable. So if you're somebody that doesn't do anything at all, I would suggest just starting by going for a walk. You know, it, it gets you outside in the fresh air. I get the blood flowing. Um, you know, maybe, maybe you work up to like walking and running, you know, periodically back and forth. If it's, if running's not your game, you don't ever have to run, right? Um, or if walking, if for some reason you don't like that, maybe start with biking or swimming, but start, start with something, just incorporating some movement. It, it should be something that you like and start with that. And then I would really like to see you add in some weights. I think, I think weightlifting is, is life changing. Um, but I, I would suggest finding something that you like, something that, because if you don't like it, if it's not, um, if it's something that is really difficult for you, like it's not, maybe it's not close to your house, it's hard to get to, something about it is tricky, it won't work for you. Find something that would work. If that means that you have to put in um, a small gym in your house, if you don't have room for that, maybe you just buy a few pairs of dumbbells, right? Maybe, maybe all you do is go for a walk outside and uh, a few days a week you you lift with dumbbells at, at home. But that, that, that's where I would start. And then I would also suggest um, with your diet, eating mostly real food. I, I really try to stay away from processed food. I would and try to get uh, five different fruits and vegetables a day at least and have protein with most meals. I mean, I think that that's, that's a good place to start. I think you'll get pretty far, pretty far with that. And then, and then your other question, what, what parents can do to um, help their kids? I think not focusing on what you look like or what your body looks like. And I got so lucky that my parents were like that. And I think it partly shielded me from, from some of the stuff I was exposed to. I think as parents, if he, if we model good eating habits, you know, we, we, you should never be saying in front of your kid, Oh, I'm so fat. Right. And, um, and, and talk, you know, it just, just, saying things like that about yourself anyways, is not, it's not being kind to yourself, but, um, and, and giving your kid comments on like, wow, you're, you're, you're really good at that. Or, or, um, boy, that was a really kind thing to do. Or I'm, I'm really proud of you for, I don't know, doing this or that, the other thing, but not, not what you look like, right. What focusing on what somebody looks like is it's, it's so external. Um, I think that that, I think that that would be the biggest thing. It's also maybe good if they, if you could find some kind of sport that they liked, not not forcing them to do a sport where they end up hating it, but if you could find something they kind of liked and and not giving them a hard time, like trying to push them too hard so that they get like a scholarship to college, you know, just just find something that they like and let them do it. And if they're not very good at it, but they have fun, wonderful, you know. Lori, thank you for appearing on Apollo Papyrus. You were an amazing guest. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so, so very grateful that you had me. It was wonderful to interview Lori about her novel and issues like body image. This is Aaron Apollo Camp reminding y'all to write and read your passion. Bye for now. Copyright 2024, Aaron Apollo Camp, All Rights Reserved. This podcast episode is intended for the private listening of our audience. Any reuse or retransmission of this episode without the express written consent of the podcast host is prohibited, except under fair use guidelines.
royalty-free music and sound effects obtained from https colon forward slash forward slash www.zapsplat.com.